Hello, I'm John Neff, Global Editor-in-Chief of Motor One, and welcome to this week's episode of the MotorOne.com podcast. So we were all set to record this week's podcast about the best and worst car events we've all been to, but then we got an email literally minutes before we started recording. It's an embargoed email from Chevy about the official pricing details of the new mid-engine 2020 Chevy Corvette C8. Now, we're not allowed to talk about what's in this email yet, at least publicly, but fortunately, the embargo lifts right before we plan to release this episode to the public, so we should be safe. On this week's episode, we're closing our doors and discussing in hushed voices the embargoed pricing details of the 2020 Chevy Corvette. Joining me this week is MotorOne.com senior editor, Greg Fink. How are you doing, Greg? Great. How are you, John? Good, thanks. And also with us is writer Christopher Smith. How are you doing, Chris? Uh, It's Corvette summer. I'm doing good, John. It is Corvette summer. We've been talking about it um, literally all year. Uh, We've written hundreds of articles about the Corvette. And um, as everyone remembers, the Corvette debuted almost a month ago now on July 18th. And, you know, after the official debut, we were just um, just the, the buzz was um, overwhelming. We've been we've been writing and writing about the Corvette, but Chevy actually hasn't released uh, much, uh, many official details uh, about the car since the debut. So now we have the official pricing in hand. This is really the first nugget of official news we've gotten since then, and there's probably going to be a lot more to come, uh, especially because we're entering auto show season, and they're probably going to like save some big announcements for each auto show. But we're getting the pricing details now, and I really want to, I'll just jump in and and start um, giving you some facts and figures about where these prices uh, have landed. So we learned at the debut of the car that the base price would be below $60,000. Now, I can confirm that that is true, and it's actually pretty remarkable. Chevy lists, is listing the base price as $59,995. Now, you might scoff because that's only five dollars uh, less than sixty thousand. However, that includes the destination charge of one thousand and ninety-five dollars. So, what the real base price? Because honestly, when we're reviewing cars, we list the base price without the destination charge. Um, so that's the, usually the the one I go by. The real base price is fifty-eight thousand nine hundred dollars. So that's significantly under. $60,000. I'm kind of shocked that they did that. And that's including destination charge, it's under $60,000. How does that strike you, Chris? It uh, it really strikes me as impressive. Um, when we were talking about this before it launched, I, I mean, even even I was always on the lower end of the spectrum. Oh, you know, it might be 60, 65,000. John, I mean, you were. Uh, I wasn't. You were, you I were was, like, I this was is like going to be 80, like 80 000. grand. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, you know, looking at the sheets. Not even the fully optioned C8 Corvette is eighty grand. It's it's coming up at right. seventy one we'll, nine forty five. I think that I, yeah, you're right. I was the one saying it was eighty thousand dollars. To be honest, I think this is the ninety thousand dollar car that cost sixty thousand dollars. I mean that base price is is not even five dollars below. It's it's like I said, over a thousand dollars below. So let's hop into uh, the trim levels because you just mentioned one, the three LT. Now there are three trim levels. They're they're very um, generic GM trim levels. The one LT, the two LT, and the three LT. So we know the one LT. That's the fifty nine ninety five, including the destination charge. So the two LT is actually sixty six thousand two hundred dollars without the destination charge. And then finally, there's the three LT which is $71,945 with the destination charge, $70,850 without the destination charge. This this is like, you know, maybe like $11,000 spread between the 1LT and the 3LT, which is, again, remarkable. I, I could have figured they could have put a $20,000 spread between the least and most expensive trim levels. Uh, Greg, does that surprise you? It surprises me for GM just because of how the pricing works on their mainstream vehicles. So to see them be so, what's the word, restrained in pricing the Corvette is is shocking to me. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I mean, the Corvette's always been a performance bargain, but, you know, you got in it and it felt still kind of, you know, a little cheapish inside and you know, I'd been using a variant of the C5 platform. You know, obviously it's at seven, but between C5 and seven, it's still a lot of the same car. So this is a kind of older car. And even though it was a great performance bargain, it, it was a great car. It just always felt a little older. 
GM is historically known for kind of overpricing their cars, making great chassis, but kind yes. of overpricing them. And here they have a car that is really great, totally brand new, and you'd expect, if anything, they would overprice it, especially at the higher end. When they said we'd go under 60, I figured the base one would be, you know, 59, right. 995 before Destination, actually, I, was, I would have guessed. And then, you know, the next one up would have been a really big jump and they'd only supply dealers with a, you know, go the Tesla Model 3, the base one of those routes where it's like very hard to get the base one, but technically it exists. Right. I mean, they could have put, they could have put $15,000 between each trim level and we probably wouldn't have complained. But the fact that there's eleven to $12,000 between the least and most just is shocking to me. I was actually um, talking to some people about the Blazer uh, recently, which you guys had in, in the Miami office recently as well and that's that's a gm car that is like typical gm where it's it's basically a good car it just falls all over itself in the pricing because it gets so expensive so quickly and there are so many options that should be either standard or part of like like a more affordable option package that when you when you when you option the whole blazer out to be competitive uh, with a, a competitor to like to be similarly configured, it's like five thousand dollars more expensive or, or some large number. And this is just so un GM to have each trim level be so uh, affordable and then chock full of um, features that people want. And we'll get over the exact feature. We'll go over the exact features in a second. Uh, I do want to like uh, bring up a couple things they have in their press release. Uh, they acknowledge in the press release that most people thought when they moved to the mid-engine platform that there would be a huge price jump or that the Corvette would suddenly become unattainable. And now we know that is not the case. Um, I'm sure there are still higher performing versions of the mid-engine Corvette that will come. I mean, there's got to be, you know, whatever they're going to call it, whatever replaces the ZR1 or the Z06, that there's going to be a mid-engine Corvette that starts over 100000 But even then, it'll be, you know, sixty to $80,000 less than the base price of an Acura NSX. And this is the performance bargain, not only of the year, but of, of maybe the decade. And, you know, let me just jump in because I have Chevy's uh, website up right now. Just by comparison, the base model C7 to 1LT Stingray is fifty six nine ninety five. So this completely new Corvette is only $3,000 more. We've seen higher price jumps from like evolutions of similar models from other manufacturers as opposed to something being all new like this. Yeah, you. this isn't, you're right. We've seen bigger price upgrades for like new colors uh, from a model year changeover. This is switching to a completely new platform with a completely different drivetrain. Plus you're getting an all new eight speed dual clutch transmission. So transmissions, big upgrade there. Um, a dry sump oil system, big upgrade there, all standard and a more powerful engine. So, you know, we're going from 460 to 495 horsepower. It's still based on the familiar 6.2 liter, but it still has to be completely reworked to work oh, in a mid-engine in the, platform. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's not it's not like they just, you know, uh, we'll give it a better exhaust and up the part. No, it, it needed a, quite a bit of engineering. Yeah, a ma majorly upgraded engine as well. So basically, you're right. For a $3,000 increase, you're getting an insane amount of upgraded hardware. All right, so let me jump into the trim levels. Um, now, I apologize. This is going to be a list of some things, but you guys can jump in if you have any comments about them. So let me go over what is standard on the 1LT. The 6.2 liter engine we were just talking about, 490 horsepower, 465 pound-feet of torque. You've got the eight-speed dual-clutch transmission with paddle shifters. Uh, the seats will be eight-way power uh, what Chevy is calling GT1 seats with Mulan leather. I have no idea what Mulan leather is, uh, but it sounds very Disney. You also get a removable body color roof panel. We knew about that. The brakes will be front and rear e-boost assisted disc brakes, brakes with Brembo four-piston two-piece front calipers and four-piston monoblock rear calipers. I'm interested um, to see how those brakes perform too, because that's also a big deal that it's going to a like basically brake by wire system with an electric... Uh brake booster. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what the pedal feel is like on that compared to the C7 and prior Corvettes. Tires are going to be Michelin Pilot Sport ALS Run Flat Performance All Season Tires, uh, and they will have tire pressure and temperature monitoring. Um, you're going to get uh, traction control with active handling and a launch control feature. Of course, keyless access with push button start. 
the drive mode selector. Uh, there's going to be a tour mode, sport, track, weather, my mode, which I imagine is going to be like your customizable uh, mode, kind of like what do they call it on Audi, your individual mode or something like that. And then finally, the Z mode, which we don't know exactly what that will be, but it's probably going to be. The, I'd the imagine track like mode. Z for Zora, but it could be the mode where it like has super cruise so you can just sleep Z mode. <laughs> it could be. Uh, although Doubt I don't it. think Super Cruise. I don't think legally don't think they want to get into standard, that. Yeah. No, I don't think you want to call it sleep mode. <laughs> um, all right. Next up is dual zone electronic climate control. Uh, these are some minor things. Capless fueling, cruise control, dual power remote heated mirrors, a central locking interior storage, the glove box and the console. This is kind of nice. You will get the HD rear vision camera and rear park assist. Um, so you'll get parking sensors on it and probably the really nice um, rear view monitor with the guides that turn. A power pull down hatch. I don't know what it means by if it's power and pull down. I don't know if it'll, that sounds like it'll pop open on its own, but then you got to pull it down yourself. Um, like it won't auto close. Uh, the steering wheel will be leather wrapped uh, with power, tilt, and uh, telescoping functionality. Uh, the base uh, stereo will be a Bose 10 speaker uh, sound system, and the touchscreen will be 8 inch diagonal color touchscreen with the latest infotainment system. And we did get a run through of that infotainment system. We, we wrote an article about that, and there was a video of a little tour through what the infotainment system looks like. And it does look like a unique version of the GM kind of standard system. The gauges uh, will be digital, and it'll be a 12-inch configurable color cluster display. It says one-touch Bluetooth pairing through near-field communication. That's kind of a, a new thing for easy Bluetooth setup. Of course, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Steering wheel controls, OnStar, power windows, LED lighting with automatic headlamps. That's nice. And cabin air filtration. So that's your 1LT. That's your standard um, base model, no option Corvette. And that's pretty nice. You know, you're not getting, you're not getting nav. Um, so the, you know, that's one thing. Um, but in terms of, of features like the base, like I'd be happy with that. I wouldn't feel cheated, uh, driving off the lot with a one LT. I said, uh, what was it a few weeks ago when we all configured sort of our dream Corvette, I stuck with the one LT just seeing all of these options. Honestly, the one LT with the Z 51 performance package, I think I think Chevy will sell a lot of those. And like Greg mentioned earlier, you know, usually you have or, or maybe it was you, John, um, the automakers will often have that kind of base entry model that has a really low price point. But it's like a unicorn that no dealer will ever order. I right. think dealers will have all kinds of these one LTs with a Z51 performance package. And and yeah. just to, and just to jump in really quick, the, the Z mode, that's actually sort of an ultra configurative mode. That's sort of a shortcut that'll allow the driver to mix and match engine, transmission, suspension, all kinds of parameters for like uh, just a quick one push, boom, you can go, you know, drive like a superhero. Okay. Okay. So I'm glad you brought up the Z51 performance package because there are a few standalone options you can get on any of the trims. So I'll go over those now. The first is the Z51 performance package and the price of that remains unchanged at $5,000. That's what it was for C7. That's what it'll be for C8. Um, and that will improve uh, zero to 60 time below three seconds, which is insane. That includes a performance exhaust, a performance suspension um, with an, uh, manually adjustable uh, threaded spring seats, uh, electronic limited slip differential, a front, a front splitter, a rear spoiler, um, larger brakes with special calipers with Z51 logos, Michelin Pilot, Pilot Sport 4S summer tires, better cooling, specific axle ratio, and also unique front uh, brake cooling inlets um, to to keep the, the front brakes cool. Uh, that's a lot of that's a lot of good hardware again for five thousand dollars. So you're basically if you add that to the one LT, you've got a car that can do zero to sixty in the two second range for under sixty five thousand dollars. Yeah. Insane. I just and, wish and, they'd offer it less, without the rear spoiler. It's so, uh, I mean, I'm sure it has a ton of aero work and it helps it, but it's so ugly. Now, see, I, I don't mind the rear spoiler. 
could it be better? Yeah, I suppose it could be better, but I mean, it, it doesn't bother me. It sort of fits with kind of the just just the weird squariness that uh, that Chevy is exploring on this car. You can get the performance exhaust by itself without getting the Z51 package. If you only wanted that, $1,195, and it boosts horsepower to 495 and boosts torque to 470. So if you just wanted that, um, it's a little bit less, but honestly, uh, spring for the Z51. Don't get the exhaust by itself. The zero to 60 in under three seconds. A lot, there might be a lot of people think, oh, the extra horsepower will do it. In this case, I mean, we don't know what no, that no, specific no. Yeah. axle ratio is, but that's what's getting you to, to 60 in under three seconds here. It's not going to be the five extra horsepower. So, uh, no, I mean, no. I think I think that's that's a key point to point out here. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a combination of a lot of things in the Z51 performance package. Uh, I think you're right. It's the axle. Uh, it's the axle ratio. I think it's also the tires. You know, you're getting uh, the, oh yeah performance tires. But, but if you want that five extra horsepower and five extra pound feet of torque and don't want to have to deal with that rear spoiler, that performance exhaust is a pretty good deal. <laughs> I guess. If or you really or you could buy, or you could buy one of those uh, nifty things that's called a screwdriver. Yeah, and but you can turn that spoiler the rear bumper off. area. We should ask if there is a rear spoiler delete option. There you um, go. That might be, you know, sometimes that's available. There'll be 12 exterior colors, six interior color themes, six seat belt colors. That's a new, that's something new. And two optional stitch packages and uh, three seats, uh, three seat choices that I think you get a different seat with each trim level. And like you said, Chris, we all got a chance to create our dream Corvettes and included the colors we chose when we did that post on, on specking our favorite Corvette. So you can find that on Motor One too. Um, all right, you guys ready to go over uh, 2LT? Well, I noticed, and maybe you did it on purpose, but you skipped over the front suspension lift system. That's an option. I did, and the reason I did is because that is only available on the 2LT and the 3LT. It is not available on the 1LT. So you're talking about the front suspension lift system that can basically lift the suspension so you can get over speed bumps or pull into driveways that have a you know a big lip at the front. And the cool thing about it actually is it's tied to the GPS system. So if you if you tell it raise uh, raise up when I'm approaching this address, it will just remember that and do it every time. Awesome. I was uh, driving around a McLaren 720S that does have a suspension lift system, but I have to remember to hit the, hit the button before I, I pull in wherever I'm going, or else I will scrape the front uh, front splitter. Uh, this will do it for you, but it needs the navigation system, and that's only, you only get that with the two LT and the three LT. Plus, its cost is eleven ninety five, but I think that's worth it. I mean, this is, you know, that this that's an investment to keep the car in good condition and not, you know, again catch the the front splitter uh, on something when you're pulling in. So. Um, all right. Who wants to do 2LT? Greg, why don't you go through the 2LT list of things and, and remind us of the price, too, before you start? All right. Well, the 2LT costs $67,295. And to me, this is the one I would get. It's, you know, I about $7,000 this is this $7, more. And maybe if you took it piece by piece, you might be like, that seems like a little bit much. But to me, the car still comes in cheaper than I would have ever expected. And the kit that's in here is worth it for my day-to-day -day living. And it starts with a head-up yes, display lots, system. Lots of good features. Yeah. You got a head-up display system. You get power lumbar support and wing seat adjustment, which I'm sure is related to the bolstering, but maybe the seats have wings in them and you get to you know fly around sometimes. You get a wireless phone charger. Heated and ventilated seats. I'm in Miami. Ventilated seats are clutch. Heated steering wheel. I'm in Cleveland. I'm in yeah. Cleveland. Heated seats and heated steering wheel is clutch. <laughs> yeah, and if I want to travel too, then heated seats and heated steering wheel. Um, you get a Bose 14 speaker audio system, which, you so know, that's, that's cool. That's up four speakers from the standard system. Yeah, that's cool. That, you know, if they could say, hey, you can save $1,000 and take that out, I might do that. I like, you know, obviously I love music, but $1,000, $1,000. But you get it, and that's a nice thing. Navigation, performance data recorder, which is basically a camera built into the car that, uh, you know, records on a memory card that in the current car, I believe it, the memory card lives in the glove box. But yeah, it records your performance while you're out on the track, or I'm sure you could probably do it on the street and, and then just it, have a Russian camera it, thing going. Doesn't it overlay the like the telemetry and and the data on the image? Um, you know, like your G forces and things like that. 
I've only used it in the Cadillacs with it, but yeah, when I was in a Cadillac ATS-V, I think it was, and I was in, I forget what track I was at, it overlays, like, yeah, the track and, you know, things about what the car's doing. I guess the track had to be uploaded in first, but, you know, it'll overlay how much throttle you're giving, how much brake Mm -hmm. you're putting on, what gear it's in. Um, it's, it is useful just as, a, I mean, I don't know how useful it really is. I'm not a race car driver, but it's you, it's fun to look at. And I would imagine there is some use if you're actually tracking the car to see like, oh, I'm giving a little too much brake there. But a real race car driver can be like, that's not the case. Or they'll be like, yeah, that is exactly the case. You get a universal home remote, m- remote which I believe is just the buttons on the probably bottom of the mirror that opens your garage door. Yeah. Nice. Not in the world. Power folding mirrors. Very clutch. That car looks pretty wide. Rear camera mirror. That's uh, GM's, and a couple other automakers do it, but GM is known for it. The mirror in the center I think rear view of the this car. This is clutch. Th- this feature, um, yeah, this is, this turns the, your center rear view mirror. It, it's a big display, and it will um, di- it will display the view of a camera out on the back. I don't I don't know if it's the same camera that's used for just the regular. Uh, Traditionally, it's up. two cameras. They have two separate two ones. cameras, right? Because they got to be aimed differently. Uh, when I've used this on some normal GM cars, I've thought it's a, it's an incredibly good and useful system. On a car like this, where you're not, I mean, you, you, the engine is in <laughs> is in yeah. your way, looking through the the center rear view mirror. So this is this is completely necessary uh, and is the perfect application for the the rear camera mirror. Yeah, I found it a little nauseating in normal cars, but because you're thrown off since there's nothing behind you. But when there's literally nothing behind you but a small mail slot windscreen you know window or everything i think i would uh convince myself to get used to using the camera mirror and it would be very helpful um you also get driver and passenger seat memory nice i don't really know why you need the passenger seat so much i've always questioned that is that for people who are like cheating on their spouses so quickly they can just go back to one like oh (laughs) she'll never know or he'll never know mistress one mistress two i i've never understood that but it's nice to have you got two sets of memory uh, front curb view camera, also very nice. So after you hear that scraping noise, you can be like, what the heck did I just hit? Press the button and be like, ugh, there's about $5,000. <laughs> um, Sirius XM satellite radio with one year subscription. Side blind zone alert, which is GM speak for blind spot monitor. Sure, that is huge because, again, the car is like, it's a mid-engine car. And already the Corvette's not known for having... Yeah, great, poor sight lines. Yeah, great sight lines out and it's a front engine car. I'm sure it didn't get better when it switched to mid-engine. Rear cross traffic alert, anti theft system, and parcel nets. That's parcel huge. nets. Got to have parcel yeah. nets. One thing I, that jumps out at me is the side blind zone alert and rear cross traffic alert. Those are the first two real high tech safety systems they've mentioned so far. So you really don't get anything on the one LT in terms of kind of advanced safety tech. Um, on two LT, you get the the blind zone and the rear cross traffic. Um, we'll see when we get to the three LT um, that it doesn't have any others. So I mean, when we're talking about um, automatic emergency braking, um, uh, advanced uh, cruise control, adaptive, you know, radar-based cruise control, um, or even super cruise, um, and some of the the higher tech stuff like that, I, I don't see it available on the Corvette at all now. This is just the, again. This is the first press release we've gotten with official details. So, so maybe those will be available, and it's just not set yet. But um, right now, we don't see automatic emergency braking or any other um, advanced active safety systems like lane keep assist or, or something like that. All we've got is sideline zone alert and rear cross traffic alert. And I'm also kind of uh, surprised too that they didn't make those two things standard. I would almost personally, because I think the car is going to not be really easy to see out of, and no beef on the car. I just think that's the nature of mid-engine vehicles. It would I would rather see the car cost fifty nine thousand nine hundred ninety five dollars before destination and have those features base. Personally, I, I I agree. I was thinking that myself, and to me, it almost seems like a a little bit of a cash grab from GM. Hey, if if you really want your car under sixty grand, here's what you got, but to really feel better and safer and have it be a little bit more easily handleable, you'll have to step up. This is this is how GM works. Is is it's unlike other companies where you feel like you 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 can get everything you need in the in the standard trim, and then the other trims are just nicer and have more you know uh, luxury features and things like that. They will put things that you want or should have standard 
in the the second trim and the third trim. It, it's just this it's this pricing strategy to kind of push you into the higher trim level. Uh, and it's annoying. And I mean, GM's not the only one that does it. Practically every automaker does it. But every once in a while, you get an automaker that has really uh, pricing that seems to be more on the side of the consumer where you get all of these things down. I mean, heck, even, Wait. you know, take a Nissan Versa. A Nissan Versa comes with more active safety equipment than this Corvette. That's what I was going to say. When yeah. it comes to active safety equipment, GM is one of the last automakers that's a bit major one that's doing this you know a lot of the other ones you know subaru you get a four-star most subarus now come standard with eyesight honda puts uh whatever they call their thing honda standard sensing. honda sensing toyota does all the you know like gm's kind of late on this whether this is a good business strategy yeah, or right. if it but they are becoming the exception to this rule where everyone else is starting to offer a lot of if not that where the car is stopping itself but at least where it's like warning you and you know the main warnings are coming standard if not the actual car being able to do things itself yeah no I, I would say the the actual active safety equipment is now coming standard where automatic emergency braking is standard we just published our first drive of the the new nissan versa which you know costs it starts like under fifteen thousand, and it comes standard with that stuff um that's becoming common across the industry and you're right gm is a holdout and and we kind of see it here on the corvette um, I agree. I would have rather have had the pricing, you know, be under 60, not including uh, the destination charge in order to get a few of those um, safety features. But again, I, a small quibble, uh, you know, most of this news is very, very good. So and to uh, be and to be fair, I mean, I mean, we haven't driven the Corvette yet. It might actually have decent visibility on the back. I mean, it's mid engine. It probably won't. But. You know, the, we do have to. We do have to throw that in there. Well, and we'll, as we'll I said, the sixty-seven thousand dollars price to me still strikes me as a really solid value oh, yeah. for this car. <laughs> but it's just more of a Absolutely. GM can't stop being GM, even when they look like yes. they're trying to stop being <laughs> GM. <laughs> totally. All right, let's move on to the three LT. Uh, I'm going to hand that one over to you, Chris. Um, give us the price, and then give us what you get on top of the one LT and two LT. Yes, well, 3LT starts at seventy-one nine forty-five, and it's really just a, a, a bit of extra swag. Um, it, you get everything from the 1LT, the 2LT, the upgrade here for 3LT, GT2 seats with Napa and Mulan leather, which I guess is like a Disney movie at Napa Auto Parts. Maybe it could be. <laughs> that sort of sounds like. I mean, we're just and, going uh, by the words they're giving us. <laughs> and uh, and the seating service. That's the seating services. And there's also carbon fiber trim in there. You get the custom leather wrapped interior, suede wrapped upper interior trim, leather wrapped door panels, and that's really it. So you're paying uh, what an extra about an extra what uh, almost yeah, four grand. Seems, yeah, this seems four, expensive four, for just leather. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is like what Mazda does with their signature trims, where they have this extra top yes. trim that's just like leather that I guess you really like leather. That's cool. But it's a lot of money for what's just a very intangible. I mean, it's tangible. You can feel it, but it doesn't add really anything more than just like there's leather. No, we don't know exactly what these GT2 seats are compared to the GT1 seats uh, that the other two trims have. Uh, so they might be like really high, higher performance spec uh, seats, but but yeah, for another three to four thousand dollars for basically uh, a full leather interior doesn't seem like a great deal. So I'm gonna stick with a two LT. Right. That seems two LT seems like performance bargain. Uh, I'm gonna say of the century, considering the century is only twenty years old. But I would say of this century, it, it deserves that title. Will the GT2 yeah, I mean, seats have the carbon fiber trim just to be? You know, there you go. In, in that, yep. I don't know. I guess we'll have to sit in them, or it's too bad uh, our man who was at the reveal, Clint, is. Out driving a Ram right now. That's basically it. That's basically all the information they gave us on the pricing, on the features that come with each trim, and on the optional features that you can get outside of those trims. Just remarkable. I mean, there's still there's so much room above the LT3 or sorry, three LT um, for whatever the next versions of the Corvette are going to be. Whether they're going to call the the Zora, whatever's going to replace the Z06 and the ZR1. There's still so much room above those in terms of both pricing and power. I mean, God, I, I, I'm doing a small golf clap uh, for GM on this on this Corvette so far. They're they're just knocking it out of the park. They they've certainly grabbed the attention of the entire world. I mean, that's seriously not an understatement. There, we we've written so many articles about this, and the thing that continually just blows my mind is how little GM has given us. 
the the hype and the drive for this has all come from the enthusiasts. And as we put out the articles, I'm sure there are some readers out there, some Motor1.com readers that are a little tired of some of the Corvette content. But believe me when I say you still want to read it. Every, every right. Everything we do, it's it's just it's just gobbled up. And that says something just about the excitement that's behind this car. And and I also want to say, though, we're seeing low pricing now. If you want a C8 Corvette, I would say buy it now because I wouldn't oh, put be your, surprised. You put your order in now? Yeah, I wouldn't be yeah. surprised in the next just two or three years to see this base model Stingray start to go up and then start to go way up. Kind of like we've seen with the Nissan GTR. I mean, that started as has a pretty good performance bargain, and now what a base GTR is over a hundred grand. Oh yeah, I mean the the original GTR, which is like eleven years old now, um, started I think in like the sixty to seventy thousand dollar range, and now the base model is 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 a good deal over a hundred thousand. So and that's a great point, uh, Chris. They may be. Um, selling these maybe even at a loss i I mean we don't know that for sure but this is extremely aggressive pricing with they with a plan they may already have a five to seven year plan of we're going to bump the price this much every year um, until we get to a point of profitability or until we start selling the more expensive versions and start making you know more money on those than we are these base models Oh, I'm, I'm sure there's some kind of plan in place i mean my theory behind this um is that gm needs to try to appeal both to the current Corvette demographic, which, let's face it, they're further along in years, and they're also very traditional in a lot of aspects. They want their Corvette with the engine up front, with pop-up headlights, with round taillights. At the same time, GM needs to try to appeal to new buyers, younger buyers, who might look at a Porsche 911 or an Audi and say, well, hey, this Corvette's actually quite a bit cheaper is giving me more horsepower i would never look at a corvette before but maybe i will now this aggressive pricing strategy kind of fits into both worlds which is why i think in the next few years the base model is going to go up you know if i had to make a um a judgment on how gm is doing on both those fronts right now i'd say they're wildly succeeding with appealing to a newer audience, a newer crowd of buyers for the Stingray. Maybe they're younger. I don't, I don't know, but um, I think they've managed to capture the attention of of an audience far larger and outside of their core audience. Um, as a matter of fact, I feel like it's almost drowning out the core audience. Um, you know, you spent some time with them at a Corvette rally right after the car debuted, and I feel like you got a. A, a little bit of mixed sentiment from the the diehard Corvette fans of like a wait and see. It looks good, but you know I want to try it when when I can get in one. Um, how did how do you describe that kind of reaction? Right, um, I, I went to an event out here in South Dakota, which actually the Black Hills out here. It's it's sort of a hot place for car events. So literally, as the Corvette was revealed in California, one of the oldest Corvette events. Um, in the world was going on out here there they had about 500 uh 500 cars Jeez, um, that's a lot and for, for out here yeah it does it does pretty good and whereas the corvette event and like the guys you know some of the special events at the national corvette museum they're kind of stacked with people that are already interested in the c8 this was this is just a total group of corvette guys you know what i would say like the classic corvette guys and mm-hmm. yeah the response was I think I summed it up as cautiously optimistic. Most of the people were intrigued, interested. They thought it was neat, um, but they didn't want to buy a car right off the bat. They wanted to see how it was going to perform, what kind of issues they were going to be. Um, most of the people were really more concerned just about those those first year problems that crop up. May not necessarily be related to the, the car being a mid-engine car. I did talk to quite a few people that wanted nothing to do with the mid-engine. Those really? were the same people. Uh, yeah, those were the same people, though, that, um, you know, they were driving a C3 or a C4, and it was like, you know, this is, this is the pinnacle of Corvette right here. And I was like, well... Well, all right. Well, if they think that's they're, the pinnacle of Corvette, then I mean they they're, they're neat, the but but yeah, well, yeah. I mean to say the engines up front with this very long hood with the pop up headlights and the round tail lights, and that's all a Corvette should ever be. And it's like, well, evolution matters. The C8 Corvette is an amazing evolution. Um, I it is going to pull in current Corvette buyers. Um, 
And I, like you said, John, I think it's going to appeal much more to uh, the segment outside of that core group. And, you know, like, like I said previously, the core group is getting along in years. Uh, I mean, not an yeah. exaggeration. At this event, I saw uh, an elderly gentleman and presumably his wife get out of a C7 um, and she was connected to oxygen with the oxygen tank that she had to oh. then pull out of the car. I mean, hey, there's nothing wrong with that like enthusiasm. Stereotype. Yeah. <laughs> en- en- enthusiasm <laughs> right, for, right. for autos knows no boundaries. But I mean, that's what GM is facing with their Corvette. And that's why we have the C8. And I think it's going mean, to be a hit. The mid-engine Corvette is going to open up um, the Corvette market to the coast. I think we're going to start seeing the Corvette more in places like Miami and L.A. I think we're going to start seeing it in rap videos. I think we're going to start seeing <laughs> it, it with with garish uh, uh, customizations. Uh, I think it's going to enter a new realm. We just haven't seen it before. Yeah. You know, can, can you I, I mean, you, it's a lot harder to picture the C7 in any of those scenarios I just mentioned, because other cars like you know, Ferraris and BMW i8s and and Lamborghinis uh, have always occupied those spots. But I don't know. I think uh, I I think Chevy is is so far deftly threading that needle between um, uh, keeping their their base happy, but then welcoming uh, this whole new group. um, And and really, I mean, they're not even welcoming. This group is like storming the castle trying to get more information. That's that's how much they've opened up the interest in the Corvette, I think. I've been to a lot of Corvettes officially for automakers. Just unofficial things, you know, like like back in my tour show days, the Mustang days. I've been to and and I'll, I'll compare it to some Mustang events that I've been to where just about every freaking car there has some sort of loud aftermarket exhaust. I don't think I heard one loud aftermarket exhaust at this Corvette rally. <laughs> 500 cars, they were all so quiet. I was just like, well, this is just a completely different world for me, isn't it? You know, and that's and it kind of goes along with what you were saying about the sort of the, the the different demographic going into rap videos. It's you know, the the buyers, hey, they just want their Corvette. They just want their nice quiet Corvette. I, Maybe I think they're not as, done. Yeah, maybe they're not as interested in making it flash. The new group's going to make it flashy. Well, the other thing I, I think, think we're is gonna... interesting is, I don't know if GM did it on purpose, but when you're talking about the current people and like, oh, there was the person with the oxygen tank that they came out with, by switching to mid-engine, they're legitimately alienating that group. Like, you can't put the oxygen <laughs> tank in, like, the trunk area and, like, throw the tubes into your nose from there because there's no trunk area <laughs> it's, anymore. It's oh, so, you're right. That it, it buyer is, so like, they're done after C7 that, because that's not going to fit their lifestyle, which, I, again, I'm like, I don't yeah. mean to, like, make little of them. I, it's awesome this person loves cars still, and I wish them the best, and I hope they're using oxygen because they just, you know they're rich enough and can afford to have great oxygen. It's not out of sickness or something, but it is like the people who are car enthusiasts and a little older and like the fact that you could fit things in back in the trunk area and kind of like wire them toward the front. Those days are gone with the C8. Yeah, there's a, I mean, that's one thing that was always cool about the, uh, the Corvette was, Hey, it was a small two seater, but it still actually had a fair amount of space. I mean, I wouldn't call it practical, but you could pop up the hatch in the back and there was a fair amount of storage. The C8, for a mid-engine car, I think does all right, but yeah, it's it's not going to be the same. Throw a couple suitcases in it for a, a cross-country trip, and reach well, back at least, from the past. Well, yeah, to Greg's point, to Greg to Greg's point, the they're just not connected anymore. The cargo space and the and the seating up front. Right. Uh, you know, I, th- I I think the the C8 has inc- an incredible amount of cargo space for a mid-engine car, uh, but yeah, that convenience factor of just reaching your hand back. I think the solution is GM needs to have an option to embed certain medical medical equipment <laughs> right in the dash somewhere or in between the seats, just built right in either. Uh, you know, a defibrillator, oxygen <laughs> tank, uh, stuff like Send that. Send your hate but, mail to john.net. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we've, uh, we'd love to hear what you guys think about uh, the Corvette, the pricing, the, the features, uh, the trim levels that we've been talking about. Uh, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at MotorOne.com, uh, where the discussion will certainly continue. And, of course, on our website, MotorOne.com, uh, where you'll find our official article about all this news uh, that we're talking about today. Um, 
Next, I want to move on to um, a listener comment we got uh, about last week's show. Um, and last week's show, if you recall, we were uh, playing a game where uh, we took all the cards that were being discontinued in 2019, and we chose which uh, which ones we wanted to save and which cars we wanted to put in their place. Basically, we save a car, but we have to sacrifice a car in order to do it. We got a comment from Blake S. Uh, he says... Totally agree with bringing the the Fiesta ST back. It left a gaping hole for an affordable Ford. In its place, I would sacrifice any Acura car. RLX, TLX, IRX, JRX, hell, anything X. They are all extremely dated and outdone by Honda products. Um, well, I, I, I can say I agree with Blake, uh, the first part of your sentiment. Uh, the Fiesta ST, I'm super sad to see gone especially because the brand new Fiesta sold in Europe looks amazing and would be great to have here. Uh, However, I disagree about Acura. I think Acura is on the verge of really turning a corner. They've already obviously got the NSX that we already mentioned. The RDX is excellent. The RDX is, is, I think, best in segment in terms of compact uh, luxury crossovers. We just saw the debut of the Type S concept, which is gorgeous. Uh, That's debuting at uh, Pebble Beach uh, this weekend, actually. Um, And it's supposed to signal design direction turn for Acura. And it looked gorgeous. So I don't know. You may not like the naming of Acura models, but I think Acura is really on the verge of of turning a corner and replacing its entire lineup with uh, a much more attractive uh, set of cars. Yeah, I'm interested to see what happens. That Type S concept looks really hot. Those, um, I guess you could say, leaked what they're calling con- conceptual renderings of the TLX don't look exactly like the Type S, but it looks like it's still going to be a really good car, a good looking car when the TLX comes out. The RDX, I'm not sure I'd call it best in class, but it's a top contender now, and it is a really good car. And yeah, Acura is definitely doing interesting stuff again. Coming up, we'll find out what we've all been driving this week. Uh, before the break, though, I want to remind everyone that if you're listening to this online, you can also get our show on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. So please hit the subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. Welcome back. During this part of the show, we talk about what cars we're driving this week. And today we're going to start with you, Greg. What are you driving this week? I am driving the 2019 Toyota Camry XLE four-cylinder. And, uh... Oh, interesting. Four-cylinder. It's a very South Florida car, more like West Palm Beach area. It's XLE, so luxury and loaded, like maroon with tan interior. If my grandma, God rest her soul, were still alive, I feel like she would love this car, just the way they set it up. So the XLE is like the, like you said, the luxury version. And I, I think that's important to point out because every trim level of the Camry looks completely different. Um, they have like almost completely different noses for each one. Uh, And the XLE, I I actually think the XLE is one of the better looking uh, trim levels of the Camry. I do too. Um, What's the the really sporty one? Is that the... um, SE and XSE. The XSE. That's the XSE. And And SE. That one looks like... Oh, and the SE. Those front ends are so busy and insect-like. I'm I'm not a fan of those. Those, Those go overboard. Uh, but yeah, the XLE is kind of understated. I think it's the best looking version of it. Um, do you miss the the V6 or the four cylinder enough? I think the four cylinder is enough. I mean, the car's kind of expensive. I want to say it's like thirty four or five thousand dollars. Don't quote me on that, but it's it's mid thirties uh, nearing, and it seems like a little bit of money considering it's still a four cylinder. But the four cylinder is good. It has like two hundred six horsepower. It moves the car more than adequately for, you know, your typical mid-size sedan buyer. Uh, it's a little noisy Honestly, at the high end, but you're not really, you know, I don't think the typical mid size sedan buyer is flooring it. In almost every mid size sedan, I recommend to people, just get the four-cylinder. You don't need uh, you don't need the turbo four-cylinder or the V6. They just add weight and cost usually. The regular four-cylinders are more than enough. And they get crazy good gas mileage these days too, like like highway ratings in the upper 30s on mid size sedans, which are, you know, they're good-sized cars. So yeah, it does sound like a South Florida car though, like a you know real estate agent would be. It's comfortable seen driving one of these around. Yeah, and if it wasn't this color combo, I, like I think it's an attractive car. Minus the the front end's a little. Even though I like this one best, that lower grill's a little too like whale getting 
krill. Yes, bailing, yeah. I believe is the word. But um, I think it's a, you know, the proportions are nice. And if it was not, you know, like wine colored red on tan, which is like, honestly, my grandma had cars that were that color. I wouldn't even <laughs> call it a grandma car. I mean, it looks uh, it looks like a young professional or grandmother car in other colors. I believe it's uh, it's officially called Ruby Flare Pearl. Uh, it's a three hundred and ninety five dollar option, mm. so uh, you paid extra for that. And the leather is macadamia, so yeah, that does sound uh, like your grandma in Florida's car. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, uh, Chris, what have you been driving? Listeners may be aware I've been searching for a new car to replace my Mazda Six two thousand four Mazda Six S five door hatchback that I love, and I'm not in any hurry. It still works well for me, but I've looked thus far at uh, the Mazda 3 and the new Kia Soul. And I was interested in the Kia Soul, but I recently drove, wait for it, a Honda Civic hatchback. And I, I have to say, it's the, it's the current top contender for the possible replacement for the Mazda. Um, oh, it's pushed out I, the Soul. It, it's it's pushed out the soul, and and I'll explain why here for a couple of reasons. One, the the Honda just it it's just more enjoyable to drive. I've never been a big Honda guy. It feels more lively. It it felt more lively to me, and I just drove I drove the sport model, um, which I think it's like a hundred and eighty horse thereabouts. It's the one point five liter with the CVT, and it honestly felt more lively to me than the turbo sold it. It, it felt a little bit more engaging than the Turbo Soul. Um, and one thing I like about it is Honda isn't ashamed of the CVT. When you step on the gas, the engine spools up and it just stays where it needs to stay until you get up to the speed you want to go. And that's not the most engaging thing I know for auto enthusiasts, but the whole point of a CVT is to keep the engine in its sweet spot the whole time. So you don't have to shift up and down. When you program in the false shift points, it's just, it's designed to make motorists feel reassured. I already know what I'm getting into. Let's make the most of that power. So I was happy to find Honda actually doing that with the Civic. Um, but the the hatch's rear cargo area impressed me most. Um, I think it's probably, and I haven't looked at the numbers, but it, it's going to be comparable to my 6 as far as um, cargo capacity. And in the 6, I hauled a washing machine with the hatch closed. Well, that's what you really, I, I've heard you talk about your 6 many times and how much you love the, the hatchback. So this seems like a very, like, like probably the most similar new car you could slide into um, yeah. from that that. I mean, how old is that? What year was that uh, six? But my six is a 2004, and I think they discontinued the hatchback in the six sedan hatch, um, 2006 or 2007. Yeah, so they they, they didn't run it very later. long, and and now you know and now hatchbacks are are you know coming back. They're called liftbacks now, and you get them on Audis, but. You know, it's it's the the trend is is sort of coming back. And actually, um, a Buick Regal is is something I want to drive next. Um, Ooh, yeah, that that be that might be well, that that might be a little over my range, but um, I, I want to see what it's like. I hope you never replace the six and just keep driving cars that you can talk about on the show. I I, uh, I, I, <laughs> I kind of want to keep this. Been an endless six. well. Yeah, <laughs> this has been an I, endless well of of new cars you've been able to drive. I should also fact check myself. I think I said the Camry actually has two hundred six horsepower. That's the SC and X SUV. He's got like an exhaust or something. The X at least two hundred three. Well, this week I have been behind the wheel of a two thousand nineteen Jeep Wrangler Rubicon four x four. And it is the two-door model. And I bring that up because we had uh, a pretty heated discussion a couple weeks ago in our chat room about the two-door uh, Jeep Wrangler versus the four-door, which is called the Unlimited. Um, at that time, Chris, you were of the mind that only the two-door Wrangler should be considered a Wrangler and the four-door can basically just be considered, might as well be considered a a cute you or or a or a soft rotor uh, I, I think my actual Peter. words on that john were a poser wrangler and that's yeah. you can send the hate mail everybody to me chris.smith motor one um, at the time i disagreed with you uh and my feeling was the four-door was just as much a jeep as the two-door um having driven the two-door though for a uh for a little bit less than a week now though i'm going to change my mind and side with you completely the two-door uh, Wrangler is an experience like no other. When the wheelbase is that short, 
Uh, and especially in Rubicon mode, the wheel tire package is huge. You can you disengage uh, the sway bars. I, I honestly felt like I could rock crawl over my house uh, in this. And I've driven the Unlimited. And at the time, I hadn't driven a two door in a long time. And I, you know, it felt like a Jeep. It had all the Jeep quirks and, and stuff. But that extra long wheelbase to accommodate the four doors. Um, once you try them both back to back, you realize like, oh man, this totally limits the extreme things I could do with my Jeep. Um, whereas the, the two door, it just feels comple- like, like it's freedom personified. Like I can drive literally anywhere I want and nothing can stop me. Um, I, I, I absolutely am thoroughly enjoying driving it. Would I want to buy one and, and have it as my daily driver? No, <laughs> like it is. <laughs> It is, it's bouncy, uh, again, because that's short wheelbase and because of the huge tires. Um, and it's, it's just weird. I know a lot of, maybe you guys in Florida feel differently because it's, it's warm or hot there all the time, but being up here in the North, like having a vehicle with sides and a roof that are fabric and plastic, um, it just feels weird. Like, and I, and I know you can buy like a hard top roof for it and I would, uh, if I got a Jeep, uh, but that's considerably more expensive too than the standard roof you get. So, um, but I'm going to be reviewing it. So you'll get to get to see what I rate it and what I think, uh, in a few weeks from now when we publish that. All right. That brings us to the end of our show this week. Um, you can, Greg, what's your, um, Twitter handle? I don't have it written down at the thinker. That's T H E F I N K E R. I had it. I just wanted to hear you say oh. it this week. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, what's yours? Chris, wait. Uh, yours is uh, CH Writing. Correct. It's not nearly as imaginative. And mine, of course, uh, Twitter handle is John underscore M underscore Neff. Um, you can find all of us there. And then, of course, uh, Motor One is at Motor One Com on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, I want to thank you two for being here with me on the show this week. It's a thank pleasure. You. And then, of course, thank you everyone out there for listening. We'll see you next week.